What's up, punks? Uh, this is Shinobi, and we're bringing you a special edition of Black Digest with Ruben Sampson to talk about his new uh, blind merge mining proposal. And um, hey. sadly, Janine's the only other one who can make it. So, uh, you know, what's going on today, guys? Yeah, I'm good. Hello, hello. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, you know, Ruben, you know, I guess, you know, for those who might not be too familiar, uh, with you uh oh why don't you tell us how you keep coming up with all of these awesome protocol change ideas and designs despite not being <laughs> a full-on developer sure yeah um yeah so this is kind of just a hobby that grew out of control um i you know just from the first time i learned about bitcoin i thought it was fascinating um and i guess i just um yeah, really step by step, just try to understand it better in order to kind of like, you know, I, I like I, I run a Bitcoin meetup here in Seoul and I teach other people. So I kind of like I'm kind of forced to understand it really well. And yeah, I just kind of dove deeper and deeper into the tech to the point where now I'm kind of able to contribute back. And um, I guess the way I see myself is kind of like a high level protocol developer, um, even though like I don't do a lot of programming. Um, it's, you know, it's more like, uh, really understanding all the, you know, all the pieces that fit within a, a blockchain framework and kind of seeing what you can do with them. Um, and, uh, yeah, so like, I mean, you know, I'm surprising myself because I don't, I don't know, you know, like most, like the way it goes is like, you think of something and then you think about it more, you think about it more and then you find out it's broken. Right. Like, and that, like that happened to me like 10 times in a row. And and now I'm getting to the point where, okay, these things are not entirely broken and they're actually useful. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it went. I mean, it's just, it's really impressive. You know what I mean? It's yeah, thanks. people have, have this notion that you have to be, you know, crack crypto, you know, program with to get anywhere near those types of protocol level proposals and shit and you know it's you came up with state chains i think like a, a year and a half or so ago now and now yep. this yep like i i, I think you're a big demonstration that 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 idea is uh you know kind of horse shit if you actually put the time <laughs> and thought in yeah sure but you know like it's also like i think there's it requires a lot of reading and seeing other people's proposals because like you know i think everybody likes thinking about cool stuff and just like coming up with all these ideas but like a lot of thinking has already been put into it and really i think for me what's kind of been helpful to come up with something useful is really seeing what what's already out there and learning all those things and then kind of putting it together with a few changes in order to make it work and that yeah you know, that includes something like uh you know uh, blind merge mining like that's not entirely my proposal it's actually like kind of a, a follow-up on uh, the work by Paul Stork on drive chains, and and this is kind of, uh, you know, it adds yeah, it adds elements of like a few other things like uh, Sigash no input, in order to kind of make it work uh, in a way that doesn't require a specialized soft fork. Yeah, uh, I'm <laughs> sure Janine can tell you I am not very fond of Paul. Yep, yeah, that that's fine. Putting like, it uh, lightly. <laughs> So I think uh, Paul, in particular, like there are a few. I think there are a few figures in the uh, in the in the Bitcoin space that are controversial. Uh, personally, you know, I try to kind of just look at the things. Uh, you know, like like take take Paul, right? Like let's say you hate certain things he comes up with or whatever. You think he has got bad ideas. Like at, at least some of the stuff he works on is is not bad. <laughs> you know, and if you if you throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Uh, I think that's a real waste. Like, uh, I, I think like people like Paul, for me, uh, even if I don't agree with him 100%, and I like personally, I think the two-way peg uh, proposal in drive chains is is too risky. Uh, but I I like that he approaches things from a different perspective, and I think that's very educational to me. So uh, generally, I, I like Paul a lot for that reason. Yeah, actually, I think, you know, before we actually start getting into your proposal, I think it might be, since you brought it up, a good idea to kind of go into like two two problems I have with Paul and yeah. the, the blind merge mining in general. Yeah. And like a lot of it has to do with like, you know, framing um, that he does. But my my first big problem 
with things is his claim that blind merged mining, um, you know, doesn't affect the the mining incentives of the main chain. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I'm not really confident that's accurate. If you yeah. really think about the fact that these block constructors need to keep you know, at least enough to cover their costs to, to run the node and, and, and actually do that. And then almost guaranteed some profit for themselves, just with the majority of it going to the miner to, to be like, pick my block. Yeah. Um, and, you know, considering how Bitcoin mining works, I mean, it's a, it's a rush to the margins in terms of mining profitability. Yeah. So any little sliver of profit in, in these side chains that that still has the costs covered in there. Like miners will just start doing it themselves because mm. more money. And then that raises all the other miners costs as the difficulty adjusts. And eventually it becomes nece- or a necessity to directly run those, those side chain nodes yourselves as a miner to compete with the others who are. And so right. I think that that distortion kicks in inevitably, even with blind merge mining. Mm. Yeah. So the first thing I would say to that is that the, the the simplicity of creating a block with black merge mining is literally it's the same effort as running a full node. You know, if you run a Bitcoin full node, you basically almost like creating a block is just like you know, there's just a couple of hashes. So you know, you already have a full mempool. You know uh, what what's the like the first couple of megabytes on in your mempool that could be used in order to create a block. You're, you're already aware of that. So in in the black merge mining proposal, anybody could kind of create a block and then just offer some Bitcoin to the miners. And it really is just kind of a question of like how, you know, like like there's there's kind of a value transition there where the, the block creator gets the fees inside of the block, the blight merge mine block, and the Bitcoin miners get the Bitcoin fee. So it just kind of becomes a bidding war. I think the block creation itself is kind of costless. Uh, but I do agree with you for another reason, which is um, that actually there's a... Um, and this is something that that Paul himself also brought up in uh, in the podcast uh, I did with him, uh, where uh, basically the blind merge mine chain has a reorg risk. So if you create a blind merge mine block, it's possible that somebody will orphan it. And if instead the Bitcoin miners are running the blind merge mine, like if they're all running this blind merge mine chain, and they all Bitcoin like full on Bitcoin orphan uh, a Bitcoin block that adds an invalid blind merge mine block, then now you get rid of the reorg risk. And the re- reorg risk, that's a cost because you know you gotta you, you gotta price in that cost. Um, so I think for that reason, there is an incentive uh, for miners to be the ones to be creating these blocks as opposed to users. I mean, I, I don't really think in the beginning that would be an issue. I no. think that would be a long-term thing yeah. maybe compounding with what I'm concerned about because yeah. it's, you know, if the miners are getting paid they don't care, but it's like, yeah, it's like, this is, I'm not, I don't like the idea that like, as far as I've thought it through, the only way to avoid those incentive distortions is to pretty much just count on businesses subsidizing and running that all at a loss because of other services that they can profit off of because that exists. And then like the entire main chain mining incentives kind of just become hostage to like they're distortion free but as as long as these subsidies exist only uh although like are you imagining that only companies are running these full nodes on on this uh blind merge mine chain or or what's the uh what's the idea kind of my attitude about side chains recently has kind of gotten to the point where you're either doing it to create a little trust like walled garden between a subset of players in which case you're just going to use a federation or you're trying to bring the the proof of work mechanism to a whole new function or you just want more throughput and i think no matter what all of these types of side chains are going to start pushing towards you you want more throughput like everybody is mm. going to try and look for that that free ride subsidized you know environment that they can yeah. run their businesses on yeah so you can imagine a a, a large block blind merge my chain and then it's not so likely that just any user is going to come up with a block for that so i i would agree with you there 
Mm -hmm. And that, that's, that's kind of the, the core of like my, my skepticism on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one, one slight problem with this is that I think you're, no matter what you think of this, it's going to happen. You know, like it's, uh, it's kind of already happening with the uh, very block. Yeah. Uh, they're doing it in a way that's very messy, but like, you know, no matter you know how you look at it, I think you're not going to get around the fact that this is now possible. Uh, and it seems, you know, you could, if, if a, uh, if one of these black mice my chains is very toxic, you could, you know, do a UASF to, to just, you know, kick out the chain or something like that. that See, would be like possible. that's never going to happen. Like by the yeah. time we're at scale and like, that's something about Paul's entire line of reasoning. I've always just thought was horseshit. Like by the time we're actually a globally important system, like that's never happening. Like you're kidding yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not referring to the, uh, so I, I'm, I'm referring more to the fact that, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain is actually being damaged by some, one of these black merse mine chains. So in this case, it's like, well, you know, it's, it's the survival of Bitcoin is at stake here. So, you know, that's, that's a different thing that, uh, than what Paul is talking about, right? Where he's saying like, oh, the, the side chain is going to be rescued by this UASF. Like, I, I think that's, you know, that's a less likely scenario, but either way, like, I agree. It's not, you know, this is, you know, kind of a last resort kind of thing and not something you should really be relying on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the my, my other big problem with, with the way Paul keeps, it's mostly with how he frames it. But like he, he the entire time since he at least got close to the, uh, the demo implementation, I think that's totally finished now, mm -hmm. uh, was like, we can just do this with just the miners. And he, he just kept doing that while he uh, went, uh, through his uh, hissy fit phase, whining about uh, a, a lot of core developers not being enthusiastic for the drive chain forking concept, mm -hmm. and um, like that's just no, like that that's that's wrong, that's misleading, and that's dangerous because yeah. if you only have the miners enforcing that and no economic nodes, like then there is no withdrawal limit. Like the minute. Yeah. The majority of miners decide they want the bitcoins in there. They're withdrawable with no delay. Yeah. So, but that's you know that's his security model for the two-way peg in general, right? So within within the drive chain's assumptions, that totally fits. And I agree with you that that's not secure. But he's right that you know miners can start offering a service and then screw over the users at any time. Like like it's true, you know. Yeah, but I just I feel like it the, the way he frames it, he yeah. tries to like. It seems to me like he's trying to create the impression that it would be safe for users to use that in that situation. Yeah. And no, right. it's not unless yeah, the yeah. economic majority is enforcing those like delays for withdrawals. Yeah. So I think that's the fundamental disagreement between Paul and, and other people. And I, I, you know, I think he's sincere in believing that. And, and you know, to, to play it out, like I, 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 also, I agree with you and I don't think it's secure enough, but to you know, play devil's advocate, like the thinking there is that, you know, the miners can either have this uh, blank merce mine chain from which they continually receive profits or they can kill the chain. And now they will ever trust a blank merce mine chain again. And they killed off the, their golden goose, so to speak, where where they were receiving fees from. Like that's the uh, that's roughly the the you know uh, argument there. Or they guaranteed that they're forced to compete in a more constrained environment that leads to higher fees for them. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess I mean I guess they're creating more block space with these side chains. So I, I don't know. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, there are many things, right? There are many things that like, and that's just a very general worry that I have about soft forks, right? Like a, a, if, if there is some kind of soft fork that could be classified as evil for whatever reason, uh, given enough incentives, right? Like, like, let's say there's this evil soft fork that creates a, uh, um, uh, an extension block and it's filled with uh, lots of uh, tether transactions, etc., and there's just way more fees coming in from this uh, uh, extension block. Then now you've got kind of this this altcoin or these uh, these these other tokens that are m the main incentivizers of the Bitcoin proof of work, mm -hmm. uh, and and they can pull the entire um, you know Bitcoin mining into a completely different direction and, and I, that's that's kind of a real problem that i think like theoretically like in practice it's not so easy to get to that point but theoretically that is that is i think that's the danger that you know you're referring to and and i'm also concerned about um 
but you know what worries me about it is that you know we're that's not going to be stopped by telling people how dangerous it is you know like like if somebody wants to do it they can they can go and do it um so so that that's also why it worries me it's like like i don't know if we're gonna you know i i think it's good to okay. warn people but at the same we, time we yeah. have to go down one more rabbit hole before we uh, finally get to your proposal in like an yeah, hour sure. um but do, do you recall um the the chain anchor proposal in 2016 out of mit mm. Uh, did, is that the thing with Peter Todd that you linked? Um, yeah, that that was developed out of MIT. He was criticizing. Mm -hmm. It was literally mm -hmm. a protocolized plan to create a KYC layer for Bitcoin and then mm -hmm. start subsidizing miners to prefer and eventually only mine transactions tied to this KYC layer. Right, right. Yeah, that's a. I mean, that's a real attack vector if if that becomes commercially successful for whatever reason. Um, yeah, that's basically kind of what I would like to like, there's like a practical example of, of what I'm describing. Yeah. And that's like, that's, that's kind of worrying to me because it's, you know, there's this attitude that like well, Bitcoin's doing so well and the attacks we've had to withstand so far, we shrugged off, we're unbeatable, but like, this is three years ago now. Mm. a government funded institution you know and th there are a lot of mit people who are very well meaning and, and very good people in this space but then you have people funded by mit doing things like chain anchor they they understand abusing the incentive structure to turn the system around on itself and attack itself yeah and that's also you know just something government could straight up do right like they could they could start paying miners to censor transactions, uh, things like that. Uh, I, I guess it's it's roughly, yeah, that's actually kind of roughly what, what was described there. Um, yeah, so yeah, that's totally possible. And I think that's, you know, something that Bitcoin needs to be able to withstand from a, uh, from either like a perspective where users actively start, you know, fighting against that by either soft forking in some kind of, or uh, more fees or something like in order to kind of counteract uh, censorship and things like that. Um, if there's not a, a mechanism within Bitcoin to kind of fight against that, you know, then yeah, that could potentially be very dangerous when an attack like that starts happening. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like you said, though, it's like these types of things. It's how do you deal with it? Yeah, yeah. That's uh, for me, that's also really an open question and something I continue to want to look into whenever i see you know information articles or people talking about this like i yeah i, I got to jump on the opportunity because yeah for me it's also like i i don't think it's very clear like like generally speaking you know when people talk about whether bitcoin is you know decentralized enough secure enough uh, censorship resistant enough i don't think that's proven like i think it's like i'm not certain whether bitcoin is secure enough right now i certainly hope it is but you know and that's also why i think anybody who tries to make compromises on on decentralization i think they're crazy because like how do you know we're secure the way it is right now just because it's working right now doesn't mean it, it will continue to work mm -hmm. i i have a very high degree of confidence it will but i still like to keep that paranoid mindset of yeah uh anything can yeah. happen yeah but um, I, yeah, I guess I uh, think I, uh, I can't imagine a government would actually be interested in paying miners to censor transactions. They would just do the more, uh, you could say, efficient thing and threaten them with prison, which I'm sure a lot of them have tried already. So maybe that attack vector has already been tried and it's not as much of a concern because for one thing, a lot of the minor, like that's the benefit of having distributed mining is that you can't just go to one of these guys and say, censor, the, censor this transaction because you would have to pay a whole bunch of actors in order for that to be effective at all. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Um, there are, yeah, there are many ways in which, uh, governments can, put on pressure and certainly uh the more distributed mining is the more different places they are to do mining and the more in they are from governments the the better in theory mm -hmm. and especially like you know the transaction selection aspect of that as much as hardware but um yeah i guess i don't know uh 
think uh, maybe we should actually start diving into the blind merge mining. So yeah, uh, yeah, all right. I think first up, uh, maybe we should go through uh, Anthony Towns' proposal for kind of a, a hacky um, covenant yeah. construct. Because like this, <laughs> e- this even like this took me uh, a little bit yeah. to kind of wrap my head around, it, and I still am not a hundred percent sure that I that I really have sure. it. Sure. So, so let me uh, let, just before starting that, I think it's good to kind of you know give a, uh, a kind of a high level overview of, of what blind merch mining is like in the sense that you know what you're doing is you've got this unique location in a block and you you're allowing users to basically uh, uh pay a fee to miners in order to to utilize that unique location and put a hash there and whoever pays the most to the miner gets to put their hash there and the question then kind of becomes well how do you how do you get that unique location in a blockchain and um you know, Paul Stork's original idea was to create a soft fork for that. That specifically, you know, I, I think he was using uh, like uh, adding an op return hash into Coinbase and then allowing uh, users to kind of like pay pay for utilizing that space. That's one way of doing it. Uh, and but the up with is kind of instead of you know creating a specific soft fork, uh, creating basically a string of transactions. Uh, each one can only be spent by the next, uh, and this is kind of enforced by a covenant. And so that's uh, that's what uh, you know what you're referring to here, uh, which is something that. Uh, so I had to, I had the uh, opportunity to spend a couple of days with uh, Anthony Towns here in Korea because uh, he he flew through um, g- going back to Australia. So I was uh, sitting in a cafe a couple of days with him, and uh, we talked a lot about these things. And originally. Um, I had kind of uh, other constructions in mind in order to make this work, but he pointed out that uh, you can actually do these co- covenants with uh, with Sigash and Eprev out. Well, that's going to be a hard one, I think, to, and that's why I kind of wanted to start off with the kind of like the high level and, and the more simple story, because I think mm-hmm. some of the listeners are going to be confused uh, if I try to explain this, but but let, let's uh, let's go and give it a try. Um, yeah, so basically, um, are, are you familiar with uh, Jeremy Rubin's work on the op secure the bag or check template verify? Um, yeah, I, I haven't checked his most recent kind of revisions to it, but uh, the the original proposal, yeah. Yeah, so that's uh, that's also relatively new and I think also a little difficult for people to wrap their heads around. Uh, but really, uh, this this trick that, uh, that we're utilizing here for blind merge mining is essentially doing the same thing as uh, as Jeremy Rubin's proposal. Uh, and Jeremy's Rub- Ru- Jeremy Rubin's proposal is basically you put a hash inside of an output, and that hash determines the next transaction that gets to spend uh, the output. And you, using this, you can kind of, you know, you have a predetermined path where the transaction is going to go, and you can even kind of, you know, um, s- uh, stack this by having a next transaction that you already defined also have a hash and then you know you have this kind of this string of transactions so that would be one way of doing uh, this as well where really um yeah you create the string of transactions and every transaction has a hash and and that determines the next transaction and and now you have this kind of um anchor on which you can uh, to which you can add other inputs and outputs in order to add the uh the blind merge mining hash uh so that's kind of high level. Is, is that like kind of clear how that would work at a high level or is that already a little confusing? I mean, that, that, that's clear. It's like what, what really yeah. threw me was the, yeah. the mechanics here. Cause like yeah, the, yeah. the op check template uh, verify, like from my understanding, you're literally just like putting the hash of an output in the spending transaction. And now like when this, this UTXO gets spent, it has to get spent to this predefined UTXO. Yes. And yeah. so, you know, like I, I had to, I literally mm-hmm. had to, to get on a call with a buddy of mine right before this to try to <laughs> wrap my head around the the town's hack with um, yeah, uh, no input. But for my understanding is now with no input because you can throw out the reference to a specific transaction ID with an output index. You can just do the the script um, thing. You can now <clears throat> actually go forward. And pre-compute the transactions and signatures way down the chain. And then with the initial one, take the signature from the the next transaction in the chain, the, the first spending one, and then 
put that in the output script so that when you push that um, that UTXO as an input in the next transaction, the signature for the next transaction is already there and it can have mm-hmm. an empty script sig or witness. And you, you're pretty much just pushing things to the stack in weird orders and places to, to guarantee this can only go to the next place. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, but I think you're, you know, you're making it more convoluted or, or at least like you're, you know, you, you have a very complex way of looking at it right now. Um, but yes, no, that, that is, that is, uh, that is absolutely correct. So basically you normally what you do is you have an output and there's a, uh, you know, there's a pop key or pop key hash in, in the outputs. And then later you provide a signature. Uh, and the signature signs the next transaction. So here in the outputs, the signature is just already there. So it's it's a pop key plus a signature. And because the signature is already in the outputs, that kind of forces it to be only spendable in one way. And this requires SIG no input or SIG as any prev out. That's the same, right? The same uh, uh, proposal, but different name. Um, because otherwise you have kind of a uh, um, a loop where you're signing the transaction ID of yourself. Uh, so you can't do that without uh, SIGash right. any prev out. It's causally impossible because you yeah. don't have part of the referent information. Yeah. And functionally, this is nearly the same as Jeremy Rubin's proposal. Mm-hmm. And so, like, yeah, that's um, one, of, one of the interesting things that... Um, you know, this kind of uh, made me think about is like you, you, this is the anchor you're using to guarantee only one um, side chain commitment um, can make it into a block per side chain and, and yeah. actually relatively time locking them one after the other to, to guarantee only one of this chain can, can be in a single block. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing here is, um, you know, the, the logic is the the new fee input and output um, uses taproot to encode to the sidechain block. But the a design choice here when you when you make this whole chain of transactions to do this with is how long do you make it? Um, do you define yeah. a cutoff point where you burn this this UTXO marking the sidechain to give it a definitive end? Do, do you leave it an open, uncoordinated problem in the sidechain consensus rules? Like that's a Mm. A design choice here now, just with the this one part of it, you can make a few different decisions here. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you're right about that. So uh, you have to kind of decide how long you want to make the chain, um, and then after that point, you yeah, you kind of have a consensus decision that people have to agree on. Um, I think you know if you put that far enough in the future, it is kind of solvable. Like, you know, Bitcoin also has a hard fork coming up because there there are some consensus issues that we're eventually going to run into. Um, but it's just years away. Uh, so I, I don't have a solid answer as to how, how that would be coordinated, but I'm thinking, you know, at least make a 10 year long chain and, uh, and take it from there. That's uh, that's my current thinking. Yeah. I mean, it's not a bad way to think about it. Yeah. And then, um, so there, there is one thing that uh, uh, related to the uh, the putting the signature, um, you know, in the output. Mm-hmm. So the uh, and that's kind of an interesting thing that I, I don't know if you caught that, but we're we're actually so this is also like after talking about it with the Anthony Towns. Uh, basically, the signature is not really relevant in the sense that you don't really need to have a pop key that is secret uh, because you're already you're committing to it anyway. Uh, you're committing to the the hash of what's being signed. So we're actually just using the generator G in order to sign with it. And what that does is it m- makes it so that everybody can actually generate those signatures. So there's no, mm-hmm. it's, there's no, you can't firewall key. it. Like it just, there's no private key. It's just, it's a G. It's just a generator. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, a neat little, uh, little trick. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and even like if there are some, if there are more opcodes like opcat if that was available, you could even uh, save a lot of space because like, the way the you know it's the signature and so the the public key and the nonce are both G. So if you could somehow duplicate them on the stack, um, that would like save another thirty two bytes. And uh, you know if you had an opcode for the generator itself, it would even be roughly as, as efficient as uh, Jeremy Rubin's proposal. But you know it's a bit of a hack, but it's just kind of cool. Mm-hmm. I like you know the, the the interesting thing to me about this is like this this whole mechanism here now guarantees a single chain of consensus and, and all the cost of it is is like you sacrifice one utxo of a minimum arbitrary value to demarcate the side chain 
Yeah. And now this is completely separated in scope from any kind of pegging in or out or how you want to handle that. Like this is just the, the coordination mechanism guaranteeing a single consensus state. Yeah. So like, what are your thoughts on how to actually like coordinate? I mean, in, in your mind, you want to do at least a, a one way pegging mechanism for a native mm -hmm. token. Like how, yeah. how do you coordinate and do that in an efficient way? And actually even like tie that to a specific side chain commitment chain of these special transactions. Right. So one analogy that I also kind of want to add here is, are you familiar with uh, single use seals? Um, yeah. So, yeah. So this is kind of a, 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 an idea by Peter Todd. It, it's just kind of a conceptual way of looking at transactions that is not, um, you know, it doesn't really fundamentally change anything. It's not, it's not really a thing. It's just more of a, a kind of a, yeah, a way of looking at it. So, so one way of looking at this is it's an auction-based single-use seal where whoever pays the most gets to seal uh, this, you know, gets to use the, the single-use seal. Oh, huh. I know that actually is uh, kind of an interesting way to look at it. Right. Um, and so, so then, yeah, like as you're saying, like the consensus mechanism and what you're doing, what you're doing with the seal, that's completely up to you. And it, it, it kind of emulates proof of work. So you could have like a, a full, a fully separate chain, like this could be an Ethereum chain or whatever, like if you wanted to, uh, it could have its own token, uh, you could pump and dump with it, et cetera. But you know, that's all kind of the stuff that uh, none of us, uh, I assume are, are fans of. So, so for me uh, uh, personally, I, I kind of looked at it and I was like, well, shit, this, this chain requires some kind of token uh, because you need a way to, uh, pay for fees within within this blockchain. Even if you just want to use it for colored coins, uh, you can't really use the colored coins for payment. I guess you could, but it just kind of gets a little messy. Like it, it, theoretically, you know, you could you could say, okay, we have this chain. Um, there are a bunch of colored coins on there, uh, and then people can just choose whatever color coin they want to pay for fees. But now you have all these different assets and now there has to be like one person who is willing to take all those assets and then pay a miner uh, in Bitcoin for them. So really, um, if there was a native token on this chain, that would significantly simplify things. But then we're back to the, oh my God, this is going to be another pump and dump uh, because now you have this free, free floating token that people can speculate on. So with that in mind, uh, one of the things I, and this was actually very late in, like when I, when I was writing this up, uh, I, 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 I just kind of thought back about the, uh, the one-way peg that was, uh, was done with uh, Counterparty, where they had a, uh, a period in which people could burn Bitcoin in order to receive uh, Counterparty tokens. I forgot what their, uh, what their, uh, the name for their, those tokens were. XR but, or XCP? XCP, right. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah, so... But the, the thing there was that speculation still happened because after the burning period was over, now it just kind of became a free floating token again. So it's kind of a pre-sale where nobody gets the, you know, nobody receives the Bitcoin. They're just burned. Or you could say all the Bitcoin users receive it because, you know, every Bitcoin burned means, you know, less Bitcoins in total. So that's kind of more value for everybody else. Um, so then I thought like, well, what if you just leave the one-way peg open so you can always burn one bitcoin for one token and initially i thought well you know that's not gonna work but you know i thought about it more and now i'm kind of very eager to talk about it to people because so far i'm looking at this and i'm thinking hmm this actually this actually could work and it actually is kind of a way to maintain the 21 million bitcoin limits and and have that be the limits for all these chains that are willing to you know participate in this kind of one-way peg proposal uh and because it's a perpetual one-way peg the token is never going to kind of out uh, out compete bitcoin it's always better to if you, if you want to speculate it's always better to hold one bitcoin because you can always burn that one bitcoin and and change it into another kind of one of these other uh black merch mine chains so yeah, just uh, just thinking about it and and looking at it, it, it kind of seemed to separate out the speculation part from the use, 
So the only time you'd want to you'd want to burn one of these tokens, uh, you don't want to burn one of your bitcoins uh, for these tokens, is if you actually needed the token on this other network. So if there was something you really had to do that requires this other network, only then do you want to move over and put your you know burn your bitcoins and turn them into these these tokens. And that yeah that removes the speculation from the use. And and that was a, a very interesting property that uh, that yeah I'm I'm kind of exploring now. Like. The, the the first thing that really pops into my mind is nothing really to do with the the speculative effect. I mean, I I don't like the idea of like these drains that are just one way permanent drains of Bitcoin from the ecosystem. But mm-hmm. I I do think you're right on the the speculative aspect of it. If you leave them open forever, I'm just more concerned about the the externality of these burned fragmented utxos that are just going to kind of hang around forever in the utxo side no no you you can uh, you can burn them with op return and then they won't be in the utxo set so that's not a problem oh wait wow how yeah. did i forget that you could do that <laughs> oh you know it's easy there's so many so many things to remember <laughs> okay well yeah then i mean yeah it's it's yeah, I definitely think that's a workable way and it kind of deals with the the issue of speculation and kind of pump and dump tokenomics, but I still think that you know, one of these types of chains could be very useful without any single native token or a, mm-hmm. a token using a one-way burn. Yeah. And that's, you know, the your your proposal kind of made a point out of bringing up that if if you design the side chain from the start with this kind of view of the side chain has to validate the main chain as well then yeah. at least going from the side chain to the main chain you can get a, a rock solid atomicity like if yeah. i try to say withdraw um then it happens on the main chain like that that withdrawal transaction that i commit to on the side chain actually hits that chain or i can i can move my money yeah. um and get it back and then yeah. try to do whatever i do to to get out somehow or some other way and i think like having a single chain like this that could have multiple federations um pegging in and out and acting as like a kind of multiple base currencies on a single chain like this yeah, it gets really interesting when you think that all of those federations are likely going to be block producers and can pay minor fees directly out of their their peg ins because they're collecting them proportionally on the side chain for fees that they get in a block um, when mm-hmm. they actually get that block mined mm-hmm. by the main chain miners, and then like there's that that quick no delay flow um of that arb of sidechain fees to the main chain miners where there's no singular token needed um just you know enough federations and then that one way atomicity <clears throat> if you do it right um you know you go to withdraw from the sidechain through the federation whose token you have <clears throat> and they commit to a withdrawal on the main chain and if that doesn't happen you don't have the control of that token taken from you on the side chain. Like you get that back eventually. You can then go try to mix it or or make that somebody else's problem or get out some other way. There's no more when you try to peg out, the federation can seize the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think just very, maybe even like slightly simpler as what you're uh, describing, but but in the same vein, I would say you could have you you could just allow people to issue colored points on this on this chain and naturally have one of these be kind of dominant so maybe you know maybe some federation comes in and starts to two way peg federated two way peg in uh, bitcoin and then everybody starts using that as uh, you know for the fees uh that would be yeah that would be possible um there's a little bit of a bootstrapping problem there i'd say and and this, this, the the second thing is like you know, if you're relying on a federation for the fees, I, I feel like it's not much of a step. Like I'm wondering if, if, if at that point you just wouldn't also rely on the federation for the block signing, right? And have them just be a separate blockchain, like the way Liquid is. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm worried there that 
you're you're removing the decentralization from the fee structure there um and you know if that's is that good enough like like maybe maybe it can be yeah i don't know and and maybe you know it's it's definitely like a little messy to create a whole nother token so i i am kind of eager to you know explore <laughs> explore that other side in order to just not have a token at all um but yeah, that that the fact that that's not going to be you know the fees are not going to be completely decentralized. They're going to rely on on some federation. That that aspect of it worries me a bit. Well, my thinking on it is that the the one way atomicity to the main chain that that gives a much stronger guarantee, and that if you're using the federation for block signing as well, without that that guaranteed work based uh, atomicity, yeah. then you you can still when you try to go to withdraw, they they have your side chain coins now, and they just don't process your withdrawal on the main chain. Whereas mm-hmm. this like this gives you the recourse to like okay, how do I deal with this? <clears throat> like I go coin join again. Or I mix again, or I swap with somebody else and try to go out through a different federation. And it's mm-hmm. just not having them doing the block signing too, mm-hmm. and and having your kind of proof of work based structure. It, it it checks the federation from that that one point where they can just completely take control of your money from you. Mm. But wouldn't you say that like liquid? because of confidential transactions has kind of a similar functionality where you can mix your coins with other people. Uh, there are other colored coins on the liquid network and you can trade with them. Uh, so, so I think there's a lot of similarity there with the, in, in the way liquid uh, functions and it, yeah. So, but you know, overall, like maybe that can be good enough. Like maybe, maybe, maybe that's worth exploring as well. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like I'd have to really sit down and think about like, is this, Aren't we just falling back on a federation now? What we're doing that that that's that's roughly my concern. But yeah, I haven't really fully th- thought thought it through. Well, my thinking is like if if you're trying to get out of liquid by actually pegging out and not just atomically swapping with somebody who will, yeah. like yeah. You, that's a point where the the federation can stop and seize your coins on the side chain and never and then give freeze them back. It at that point yeah and okay. like just like a federation on your design where they're removed from just the block signing aspect yeah. of it yeah. like that's no longer possible mm, yeah yeah one way uh, in which the federation at least uh, can act like, like for liquid like the, the way they have it written like right now the 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 people that have the multi-sig the coins they control the coins and the people that are the block signers are the same set but they don't have to be, so that's kind of like another one, one of those like changes you can make there. Uh, but no, you, you're right that they have absolutely no control over the flow of tokens, uh, and that that does, yeah, it, it, at the yeah that does kind of add another layer of separation that that I find uh, I do find appealing. That's true. Yeah, because mm-hmm. it, it's just like I just I really don't like the idea of one way burns into things because it's it's just markets on the long term average out to the wisest decision mm-hmm. but in the short term they jump at all kinds of stupid shit and yeah. like that kind of drain is just a, a one way like like you know yeah. what i mean wealth gets redistributed when things pop and fail usually but this yeah. kind of burn into a system like that like it's just gone that there is no that works there, its way back around oh no no that's so so yeah let's talk about that because like uh, like like I, I agree with you there there are multiple ways to solve this problem uh so so I, you know like but but I, i'm interested in, in this discussion because i think the one way peg is yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to wrap your head around. So, so one of the things that I think uh, you know, you're not you're not adding to here is that the burn actually hands coins to existing Bitcoin holders, right? So, if one million Bitcoins get burned, that means that now we have one out of twenty million instead of one out of twenty-one million or or, or whatever. So, so that is actually that makes the existing Bitcoin holders. Uh, have more value relatively like if this if this chain for which 1 million coins were burned that just dies and disappears and those 1 million coins don't even exist on an alternate chain anymore then now uh that means that anybody who didn't burn their coins they're they're going to be uh, they're going to have more value so the value doesn't disappear 
Yeah, but it's it's the the flow of of redistributing that is like mm-hmm. it's so destructive versus if you could just pull the coins back out. Uh yeah, I mean pulling the coins back out is vastly preferable in in any situation. That's true. Uh but you could like even with a two-way peg, right? Like there could still be like failure on the alternate chain. Like let's say you have a two-way peg into uh, even let's take liquid for instance right if uh if confidential transactions turn out to be uh you know bugged and there's an inflation bug well now now all those people lost their coins right uh so you know there's there's kind of a similar risk there already um and yeah so so yeah i, I do think there there's kind of a lot of similarity i don't, I don't think the burning particularly means that anyone is is losing anything but you got to be real careful because you don't want to burn into a chain like like basically the only time you want to burn into the chain is if you have some use case there and you think that the the, there's going to be a sustained demand for that use case because if at any point you know let's say you you burned over like one million coins or something and if they're in active use and if there's always kind of a demand for for that level of coins then great but if the demand ever goes below that one million then now uh the value of those tokens goes goes below uh one bitcoin is one one token so you got to be really careful with burning your coins if you burn your coins and there's not an actual demand for those tokens, then that means that people are going to lose out. Um, but but it's all based on actual use, and I think that's the big difference. Right? There's no speculation, right? You you will never burn a Bitcoin in order to speculate on this other token, because y- you can burn that, that coin at any time. So just holding the Bitcoin is always better. I mean, I I I get you there, and I I don't disagree with the core logic, but I'm I mean comparatively. Yeah, when you look at kind of federated um, chains and more specifically the the peg in and out structures, well, the, the, I think there's a lot of potential there for disaster recovery in consensus failures because yeah. of the nature of the the federation, and that's something not really being looked into yet because we're just getting these things up and running. Yeah. But like, you know, yeah. if Liquid failed um, right off the bat, um, for one thing, all of the exchanges and businesses and everybody like getting together can sit down and go through their shit and their transaction histories and establish, okay, this much of what's on chain is there and establish that is clearly established. And now we have this whole gray area of holdings outside of those businesses. And that's an immediate mitigation at least, and then an isolation of what needs to be scrutinized to mitigate the rest. And that's just like right there, just human beings stopping mm-hmm. things and looking at that is, yeah. is a mitigation that, that's possible right now, yeah. let alone much more like script-based or like automated failure systems to respond to things. I mean, mm-hmm. like I think zero knowledge proofs, people get way too hyped up about them, way oversell them now and just treat them like magic. But I do think there's mm-hmm. a lot of potential there in the long term for right. things to get extended there. And so yeah. I think that, that, that having that that federation with the possibility there like that that's a very strong place to to start and and think from because mm-hmm. just having human beings involved gives you that base level of we can stop and mitigate something yeah so uh, just a small point is that if there is actual like quantum you know uh inflation like there's an actual an actual inflation bug i think at that point uh, you cannot really recover the history because then it's just all kind of gone. But uh, but you know, other than that, look, uh, I'm you know, as you know, I'm, especially with state chains, like I'm all for federations, right? Like I think they are very useful. I think we should be using them. I think they're a great uh, thing to you know do two way pegs, and I think that should all be explored and and used. Um, I, I think it's just a different trade off here, right? Where if you have this one way peg, you can actually do it without relying on any any third party or group of third parties uh, such as a federation and that is you know a fundamentally different situation and you know let me just give you one 
crazy scenario that is unlikely to happen, but that would be possible with the one-way peg and would be unlikely with the Federation, which is a version of Bitcoin that is kind of, you know, is like meant as a hard fork, but for some reason, you know, we don't get consensus, which is, you know, not, not too strange. And it happens as a one-way peg. Then over time, it turns out that this, this intended hard fork is actually better than Bitcoin. And people vastly prefer it, and everybody starts burning over their coins. And then eventually, maybe everybody moves over. And now you have kind of essentially you have this kind of opt-in hard fork where everybody is now on the other chain. And you wouldn't want to do something like that if it was a federation. You know, nobody would want to move over to a federation. And you know, I know this is like a crazy scenario that I don't think is going to be very realistic or ever going to happen. But it kind of points to the, you know, the value of there being something fully decentralized, even, you know, even in a scenario like as a, it's kind of a one-way peg. Yeah. But, you know, even then, like you can see that demand for it in a federation and go, Hey, let's do this version of it. But I mean, like, I really, I really do got to push back though on, on the idea that if, if range proofs get broken, something federated like liquid is just gone Hmm. because you, you, you won't be able to go get all of the individual users maybe, or every chain of every transaction, but you can get the, the businesses that are prime holders of things on that chain Mm -hmm. and then look at that. And that that's a whole different game of a, a degree of certainty in, mm. in what you ascertain from that small snapshot. I mean, as soon as these coins are moving like on the liquid blockchain, the whole point is that none of the Federation members, none of the exchanges know where these coins are going. And if no, those they if know those... what they hold though. They know their holdings and they can just yeah. flip the whole switch and turn it off. Yes, but then they have the coins, but the, the those coins are not going to go back to the users because, you know, let's say I had 10 Bitcoins on an exchange and I had them on the Liquid Network and, you know, I, I sent them to you uh, on, on Liquid, but like nobody actually saw that happening. And now the those transactions are no longer reliable because the the actual range proofs are broken. Uh, and now the exchange gives me my 10 Bitcoins back and you don't have your 10 Bitcoins that I No, but that's you. the thing. I mean, it's like nothing could be perfect in that situation, but you can stop right now, assess mm. your current balances and what is yours, what's your customers on Liquid against the actual on-chain Liquid reserves and everybody like vouch for that first, deal with that. And then they can kind of just sit on the rest and, you know, as much as it it sucks and like anybody doing questionable or shady shit on liquid would be in a tough spot. It could kind of be like a, sorry, um, like cough up your whole wallet or, um, you're not getting anything. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't disagree with you. Like, I think that's just a different trade-off. Like, like, I think that's also entirely possible and also very valuable. So you know, I think both approaches should be looked at, attempted, tried out, and and yeah, uh, fully compared uh, uh, against each other. Yeah, for sure. And also another aspect is I'm I feel like having this type of consensus mechanism for something where the tokens and bitcoins are solely federated in and out like i i i need to sit and think about it more but i i i I intuitively at least i feel like that could help mitigate some of my concerns over the the verification costs and everything shifting to miners in the long term because these federations are going to be based on solid, like long lasting businesses to do that in the first place. And like by all sharing a common area like this, they can come and go without just destroying coins unless they exit scam or something. Um, and, and kind of have that, that subsidy to prevent the minor distortions be on a much more solid 
like footing. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the Federation could just as well distort miners, right? Like if they if they had all the coins, they had all the power. Like I think that's that's similarly risky in in my eyes, but uh, but yeah, it's hard to hard to like yeah. I, I find those kind of scenarios very difficult to to fully uh, wrap my head around. But but yeah, for me, I don't think having lots of coins in control of the Federation is going to uh, make me uh, make me feel any more comfortable about that that specific scenario. Well, I mean, if if they're widely distributed enough and numerous enough, I mean, you know, I think mm-hmm. you know with with the way I see the second layers linked directly into the main chain evolving in the long term and synergizing like basic channel constructs, state chains, channel factories. Like I don't think we'll have real scalability concerns in the very long term when you kind of play with the trust models on those a little more granularly. Mm -hmm. And so I think side chains are really going to be like, what is the stuff that we couldn't get into Bitcoin before it stopped changing? Like what is the stuff that you just can't do with this type of model? And I think like, you know, if you just have a few environments like that with a wide distribution, any mm. group of businesses or people can be federations in and out of that. I I think that would reach a very distributed and stable equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. I I see what you're saying, and I, yeah, I do think that's going to be you know if you have like every city has its own federation or something, right? Like like something like that, where you have some kind of local uh, local point uh, that you rely on, and then all your local transactions can be, you know, easily on chain, a chain that nobody else has to verify. Uh, maybe something like that could uh, c- could be reasonable. Yeah, I-, I agree with that. Or it's just like businesses um, dealing with their sure. own capital for like investment contracts. Or yeah, it's like- mainly yeah, it's going to be like transaction flows. I would say like wherever a lot of money is moving like those parties that move a lot of money back and forth they have an incentive to create a federation between them mm-hmm. and so i think you know i i feel like this is the second time i i did this because <laughs> like you, you 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 threw out state chains and i chewed on that idea and i kind of came to you and i was like you're wrong about this this is going to be a totally different thing in the I guess the abstract sense. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm, I'm trying to do it again. <laughs> yeah, but I mean that's uh, you know that's how we uh, learn, and I, you know I think it's good. Like like I don't you know for me I always try to have this perspective of just like not this is the way it's going to be or that is the way it's going to be right. Like I have my personal of preference and my personal view, obviously, right? Like I you know I think it's going to be like this, and you think it's going to be like that, but but you know I always try to have a broad mindset of. Being like, okay, that's a possibility too. Even if I think it's less likely, something that's worth exploring. And you know, that's that's kind of how I approach your your views on this. Is where, you know, I, I kind of add it to my own list of possible views. And even if it has not my primary preference, I think that's valuable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that is what I, I I've liked uh, about talking to you. You know, the past couple of months, it's like you. You, you you don't take it personal when somebody <laughs> takes your idea and just starts t- tearing it apart and putting it back together. <laughs> no, and I'd say I you know I I think that's necessary, right? Like uh, like you gotta always look at it. Like I mean, the way I, I view it is like you know you you come at me, you're you're like hmm, I don't know if this is gonna work. I don't know if that's gonna work. That seems bad. Like yeah, that's how I think. Like yeah, you know I I try to be critical and I try to be skeptical and I try to see how all the ways in which this cannot work. And, you know, I'm noticing like the more I learn about Bitcoin and all these related things, the more I see things that don't work, right? Like, like the more you learn, the more, the more things are broken, basically. Um, and, you know, that's also kind of, I think, the difference of the mindset between like, you know, people at the Ethereum camp and at the Bitcoin camp where, you know, in, in Bitcoin, it's like, try and find the problem. If there's no problem, okay, cool, we move forward. And in Ethereum, it's like, oh, this has potential. And... Okay, let's just work on it and work and work and work until it works. And 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 there's there's no thinking about like, well, what is the actual problem? And you know, like, there's no skepticism. 
Um, so, you know, I, I always, I always see that as kind of a positive sign when people are are willing to be skeptical, and and that that to me signals that that these are interesting people to talk to. And okay. it's always a good idea when you're have, dealing with tons of problems to then try to deal with the problem on New Year's Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way of doing it. But yeah, Janine, you got anything uh, you want to talk about? I feel like it's just been like me and Ruben this entire time pretty much. No, I'm, I've just been trying to wrap my head around it because this has been outside my area of study. So I was mostly just listening. All right. Um, here, here let, 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 let's flip the tables around, uh, Ruben. Let, 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 I'm, I'm yeah. going to toss out a random idea I've been thinking about the past few days, and then you can tell me what what, what should be different and why it's and, stupid. And all the way, ways it doesn't work? Great. Okay. Okay. So you know, you know how it's just been taken as gospel um, for the entire history of Bitcoin that uh, all time locks should only work um, in, in a forward way, like it's invalid until, not mm -hmm. um, it's only valid until. Yeah. Um, why? Why not break that gospel um, mm -hmm. now that we have Taproot and we can kind of annex away um, different script versioning? And and pretty much you have the option now with Taproot, you can leave that override key on top or you can tweak it and make that invalid. And so like really how how is the way you can fuck this up in, in the way that everyone was always concerned about um, you know, pre-signed transactions that are people's only way to get their money becoming invalid because these are whole new constructs now, um, not affecting anything from before. And then you, you could effectively just make layers of taproot trees um, that periodically like flip control just by that UTXO existing. Like this key set, uh, is good until this block and then it expires and then this one's you know uh time lock becomes valid and then it has an expiry on the other end mm -hmm. yada yeah and you just build a whole tree of that to lock a utxo to so so what's the uh one thing that I, I'm, I'm not clear on is what the use cases of this uh like why why would it be useful to have keys that can only sign up until a certain time period and then not anymore like what's the uh, what's the use case here? Well, I think one would be kind of estate planning or like escrowing for emergencies or dangerous situations you know are coming up, or with um, you know combining this with Musig, um, just slowly rotate through a very large group of people where only a subset has access to move something. Mm -hmm um hmm, yeah because like i guess the way it works today is more like you know uh key a can sign for it and then a week later key a or key b can sign for it and then another week later key a or key b or key c etc um so i mean the the general problem with this is just the way bitcoin core is set up and how software is 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 created where you have a transaction enter the mempool and you don't want to second guess whether that transaction is still going to be valid at some later point. Um, so if you have a transaction that's signed by a certain key and the key becomes invalid after a certain number of blocks, uh, this adds a significant amount of uh, validation complexity uh, to Bitcoin Core. And that, and that is why it has been avoided. Um, Maybe if there is like a very compelling use case for this, right? It it could be somehow considered to be worth the cost. Uh, and I don't know exactly, you know, what the cost is in terms of programming, but this is this is repeatedly what I've been told when I came up with any idea that that involved invalidation. Uh, that uh, <laughs> it's it's just not uh, yeah not viable from a, a validation perspective. You know what? Fuck Bitcoin. I'm I'm going to Bcash. Hey, just uh, make it a blind merge my chain and and do your do your validation there. <laughs> You're all good. 
Uh, it's, just, it's just a random thought I had because it's like <laughs> it's it's always been taken as gospel, and I, I'd never heard the yep. the rationalization about the yep. uh, verification complexity just before. It's just just the yep. golden rule of a transaction that's signed should never be invalidated because right. yep. there yep. there were lots of weird storage schemes from back in the day. Yeah, I I haven't fully wrapped my head around it, but you know there are also things like you know if there's a reorg, uh, do you have to then reconsider whether transactions are valid or not? Like there's there's a lot of a lot of complexity there uh, that is just kind of largely a lot of it is just avoided by the fact that you when something is valid, you know it's not going to be invalid anymore. Ah, too sure. Yep. I just want to break things and do things they're not supposed to. Well, that's uh, you know, that's how you learn. You just uh, keep trying. Yeah. So I guess um, yeah, I think I think we did a pretty good job of of going through the whole merge mining concept uh, and keeping it digestible. Yeah, that was uh, that was fun. It was good for me as well. Like I, I felt like you know, especially like the one way pag is kind of out there. Uh, as you know, like I I showed you a draft, but I'm currently writing an article on it, which I'll probably publish within a week or so. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 just kind of like, yeah, you know, I'm. I wouldn't be too surprised if at the end of the day, this is this is a little bit too crazy, but I see enough potential for it, it at least to need discussion. Uh, and I'm glad this was kind of the first, you know, first little little uh, short discussion uh, on this topic. So that was great. Well, I mean, I I don't know whether to to be amazed and happy that you have once again come up with a very brilliant idea or very angry um, that all this idea requires is pretty much what L2 requires. So <laughs> if we get the components for the really advanced payment channel, channel factory, state chains, then this simultaneously becomes possible. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there might be a way to block this specifically, but the problem is that, you know, with the... Uh, uh, also, Jeremy Rubin's proposal that enables it as well, and you can already do it in a more spammy way, which is what Veryblock is doing, right? Like instead of instead of having this one location, you can just use up as much block space as possible. So you know, right now, let's say if there's like one Bitcoin worth of um, fees coming from this Black Merch Mine chain, then in in the Veryblock variation, that would mean that you would use up one, you know, you would use up that one Bitcoin just just in terms of block space so you would just be bidding the fees up um so that that you know that sounds awfully wasteful so yeah it's kind of inevitable even even without the soft forks there's a way of doing it this is just kind of the better and the cleaner cleaner way honestly i i wouldn't want to at least at least at first i think Unless my brain goes here's some other fatal problem in the middle of the night one night out of nowhere just because it's 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 tinkering with adding more things after we get new building blocks that we need to see integrated and, and really you know battle tested and ultimately i'm i'm really like i thought i would for the rest of my life uh say die in a fire i will die on this hill fuck your proof of work involving sidechain but with a lot of my thoughts on how federations can synergize with this, I'm not so sure that's my attitude about this one. Hmm. Yeah, um, I think, uh, you know, I think just more discussion is necessary. So I hope, you know, this will spur some comments from from other listeners and uh, anyone who wants to discuss this, feel free to come chat with me. Um, just one one little thing that I wanted to bring up is um Personally, I, I I try not to call this a sidechain because the two-way peg, like, I, I feel like you, when you call something a sidechain, it's a two-way peg. I don't know what your opinion on that is, um, but I, I guess there's kind of a lack of terminology, but I, I just call this a blind merged mind chain. Um, yeah, what what do you think? Like, let's say there there was no two-way peg on, on this chain or the two-way peg was kind of like not primary to the chain. Do you think we should still be calling it a sidechain? I mean, I think if it was solely a one-way peg, it's debatable. But I think if there's any way, even through secondary means, to peg in mm. and out of it, like that, that that qualifies. Otherwise, like, mm. why are we calling liquid a side chain? Because they're yeah, because their primary asset is a two-way peg. Um, that's 
that would be roughly i mean it's you know it's an arbitrary i agree it's an arbitrary line but um yeah to me at least like the two-way peg is fundamental to calling something a side chain but it's like you know i could equally like i could right now just be like ruben send me some bitcoin on the main chain and mint a token on liquid and give you that and i just peg you into liquid like the at yeah. the end of the day like the the main chain could I mean, or the main federation could be out competed as the dominant chain on on liquid in terms of volume i mean at yeah. least yeah you know, disregarding how they baked it as the, yeah. the fee layer. And that's true. But that's also true of Ethereum. Like you could, you know, you could peg Bitcoin into Ethereum. You could outcompete Ethereum on, on their chain, which nobody would ever do. <laughs> but, you know, it gets weird like that. Like I, I think there, you know, there are many, there are many ways in which we can break the, uh, the terminology. So yeah, I, I agree with you though, that it's, it's like a little, like it's hard to draw a line somewhere. That, so that's, it's a little weird. Yeah, I, I, I don't like the terminology that's growing up around second layers. I don't like the terminology around forks. I don't like the terminology on around the boundaries between things. Like it's Yeah. It, well, it, but yeah, you gotta come up with something better. Though. Like you can't just complain about it, right? <laughs> that's the problem. I don't have an answer either, so yeah. I mean, it's just one of those things, I think, um, in lulls, um, we need to all drum up huge arguments over this um, and, and and figure it out. Yeah, uh, just more discussion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess, um, you know, do you have anything else uh, you wanted to talk about or any any incomplete ideas bouncing around your brain? Um, I guess I can uh, briefly mention the proof of work fraud proof stuff I've been working on. Have you seen that? Um, no, actually, I hadn't. Oh, okay. Well, let me at least give you a short introduction to that then. Um, so this is um, this is a post I got. I don't even know. This must have been like uh, I don't know, like three to six months ago. Uh, I put out like a post on the on the mailing list about uh, improving SPV, basically. So you know how with SPV mining, the um, the security model is basically that you assume that 51% of all miners are honest? Yeah. So the idea I came up with is basically a way to improve this from 51% to, mm, say, the assumption that roughly 10% of all miners are honest. And the way you do that is by taking a fork as a potential fraud proof. So if you see a block being created that's not building on top of the, the longest uh, proof of work chain, so let's say you know you have a chain that's 10 blocks long, and then suddenly somebody creates a block for that, that builds on top of block three. So that's strange behavior, right? You're, you're like, okay, well, some miner decided to extend the block from block three to block four, even though there's a block 10. So what that means is that maybe block four on the longest chain is actually invalid. And this miner is actually creating this block because he's, he's trying to orphan this chain, this invalid chain. So if you had a method to download the block, uh, to download block four and validate it, like in you know in a vacuum without without any knowledge about the rest of the blockchain, which which is actually like not not so easy, but let, let's just assume this. Uh, then you could check block four and you could see like oh yeah this uh, this miner actually is orphaning this block because it's invalid, and then as an SPV uh, node you can you can ignore that longest chain and switch over to the other chain, and that's uh, that's roughly the idea in a nutshell. And there are some issues there, which is you need to have the UTXO sets in order to validate mm -hmm. the block. So you need some kind of UTXO set commitment, or there are some there are some ways to do it without a soft fork, but but they are a little, uh, they're yeah, they're a little stake in the trust model. Yeah, and a little complex to get into. So, but if you're interested in that, you know, like I, I think that's probably too much to get into now, and you haven't really seen the proposal. But check it out on the uh, on the Bitcoin mailing list. Okay, but like. I mean, are you just kind of trying to go like off a probabilistic um, assumption here, or actually trying to take a crack at a like tying this into a UTXO commitment? Um, so I don't like. I think we are gonna get UTXO set commitments eventually. I think it's gonna take years, but 
it, it just it's kind of a natural and logical thing to do um so kind of with that in mind i think eventually this will be viable and then there is a non-software non-software way of doing it that could work today uh but yeah that's a little bit more complex and uh yeah that, I, i'm not i don't think i'm going to be able to explain that just uh, uh just by talking to you right now um and just very generally speaking, like I don't really think SPV is viable, and I think everybody should just run full nodes. And I think even this model, where you have to put less trust in the miners, so you only need you know ten percent of miners to be honest, or something along those lines, um, yeah, you know, that's still not good enough, and we still need people to run full nodes. But it's uh, it's an interesting, it's an interesting little technical kind of uh, way of at least improving it, and. Uh, personally, I think you know people that are talking about lightning light clients, they should be looking into this because I feel, and that's kind of one of the worries I have. Like all the all the lightning nodes that connect to your full node, I'm very happy with. All the other ones, I think, are not really thinking about what the security implications are of that. So, uh, honestly, my only problem with the ones that don't hook up to a full node are ones that are using blind um like block fetching like that they're they're just getting filters from a centralized source yep. but they're not using a single centralized source as like the this is the canonical chain yeah you mean if they if they had more multiple sources and they could kind of check um well, well, one of the problems is with the current neutrino proposal is that you can't really um you can't really cross check um, the filters. So if you get filters from two sources and they're not the same, you have no way of verifying which of the filters is correct. Um, so yeah, there, there are a bunch of problems there that make it kind of difficult to to rely on some kind of... I mean, it's, it's just pick a single source for your filters yeah. and for your blocks so that you don't have just this blind bouncing and following proof of work because i we're i think we're making good headway in getting away from that kind of wallet model for the most part everywhere and i don't want to see lightning start dragging us back that way yeah yeah so that's you know that's roughly my concern as well where i, I think there, there there's a lot of assumptions there on where the information is coming from and it's not quite like unless you connect to a full i I feel like that's the only way to get around it really at the end of the day you just connect to your own full node and then you're good everything else kind of questionable Mm -hmm. all right man i think i think i'm I'm pretty much out of stuff to dive into that's it for me too man we talked about a lot and it was good so i guess uh janine is uh you got anything to say? Um, no, I'm good. Uh, just because uh, in the intro we didn't really give much of a background on you, so maybe you would want to do that. Mm-hmm. And um, I know you have a, a podcast that you do also, if you want to give a plug for that. Yeah, so I mean, I would just say if anyone is interested in all the stuff I talked about, go, you go find me on Twitter. Um, and yeah, I've got a podcast which is called Unhashed Podcast that I do with uh, three other co-host, co-hosts. Um, it's a fun little podcast where we do a bunch of banter and talk about the latest Bitcoin-related news. So yeah, check that out. Mm-hmm. It's actually one of the few because po- I don't I don't have enough time to listen to other podcasts ah, on top you're a, you're of making listener. this one. Okay. And I I actually did listen to that one, especially after um, the episode with Adam Gibson. Oh, okay, awesome. Yeah, we uh, we we have like two types of episodes. Like one is like more of the interview style, and the other one is more like talking about the news. Um, and uh, yeah, so depending on like what you like, but uh, it's a it's a fun. I think it's a more you know like kind of casual, easy to listen to podcast where we still talk about you know Bitcoin related stuff and uh, and a bit of tech here and there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. Uh, we we pull the exact same formula. <laughs> <laughs> sure yeah all right um yeah this has been real fun man um you know i i hope you don't wind up being somebody who just opened pandora's box and and, and kills bitcoin in 10 years 
<laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, you know, like I do worry about that in terms of like, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, like, like even the, the proof of work fraud proof stuff, I'm like, should I even be talking about this? Because I don't really like SPV. Uh, but, you know, I feel at the end of the day, we just, you know, it, it's like, it's like the security through obscurity argument, right? Like you can't just hide information. I feel like it just needs to be out there. Unless you're like absolutely certain it's just damaging, well, then you better like start working on a way to mitigate it. But like, other than that, I feel we should just kind of like, you know, keep trying things, even if we're not fully certain what the implications of it it are going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I hope everybody enjoys listening to the conversation. It's been fun. And I guess uh, we'll catch you all later, punks. <laughs> Was there, was there,